Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the Big Data Europe webinar organized within Societal Challenge 6, Europe in a Changing World, Inclusive, Innovative and Reflective Societies. This is the second webinar organized by CESDA, which is Consortium of Social Science Data Archives. Today's theme is New General Data Protection Regulation that was recently adopted. So I'd like to welcome our guest presenter today. It is Vigdis Kualheim from Norwegian Research Data Archive, which is part of CESDA. I would also like to welcome my colleague Martin Kaltenbeck, the CTO of Semantic Web Company from Vienna, which is a technical partner in Big Data Europe project, and his colleague uh, Thomas Turner, who is also assisting during this webinar. And finally, my name is Ivana Versic. I'm acting administrative director of CES Domain Office, and Martin and I will be your hosts and moderators during today's webinar. So first, a few words on organization of this webinar. Uh, there will be a short introduction about the Big Data Europe project and its main goals and its partners. Then a few words about CESDA and its role in Big Data Europe project. And after that, the floor will be handed over to Victor Squalheim, our presenter. Uh, just a short notice that this webinar is recorded. And you can see on the panel that the chat section is actually open for you to put questions there for the question and answer session in the end. So, to begin with, again, welcome to the second Big Data Europe uh, Hangout or webinar, as you wish, within Societal Challenge 6. The full title of uh, Big Data Europe project is Empowering Communities with Data Technologies. It is a three-year Horizon 2020 project, and its main instrument uh, through which it is implemented is coordination and support action. The main goal is to develop an integrated stack of tools to manipulate, publish, and use large-scale data resources. As I have already mentioned, it is a coordination and support action, which means it's implemented through both measures, coordination and support. So for coordination, uh, implementation goes through engaging with a diverse range of stakeholder groups which are represented by a Horizon 2020 societal challenges. There are seven societal challenges from health, agriculture, energy, environment, to social sciences and humanities in Europe in a changing world, and finally in security area. So this is coordination part. Support part is implemented through designing, realizing, and evaluating a big data aggregator platform infrastructure, which is actually developed by our technical partners. Rationale behind Big Data Europe project is to show the societal value of big data, to lower the barriers for using big data technologies, which require effort, resources, and data science skills, and especially the latter is limited at the moment. And finally, the final argument is to help establishing cross-lingual, cross-organizational, and cross-domain data value chains. There are in total, 12 partners in the Big Data Europe project, and uh, they are mixed from community partners, networking partners, and technical partners. We work in pairs. So, CESDA, as networking and community partner, has Semantic Web Company, represented by Martin and Thomas in this webinar, as a technical partner. So, we work together in most tasks within this project. Uh, when it comes to CESDA, it's a consortium of social science data archives. It is a research infrastructure, a permanent research infrastructure that aims to deliver better access to data, regardless of data location or researchers' location. At the moment, we have 15 member countries across Europe, and in each country, we have a data archive, which is appointed by the ministry, and that data archive is actually representing that country in our consortium. And we have one observer country, that is Slovakia. The role of CESDA in Big Data Europe is mainly to be the main representative for Societal Challenge 6. So we represent social sciences and humanities. And our main role is to coordinate the Societal Challenge 6 and, uh, to, and its potential users in the field of social sciences and humanities. Uh, but our role is also to build the interest group, to collect requirements, and to assist our technical partners in building of the big data infrastructure, and especially the access point for social sciences and humanities. So I would like to end with this part, and thank you for listening, and hand over to, to our presenter uh, today, our 
main guest. It's Vigdis Kolheim. So, Vigdis, the floor is yours. And again, for all the listeners, you have a chat section in the panel. Please put your questions there so we can address them later in the questions and, and answers session. So, thank you again, and Vigdis, the floor is yours. I am waiting. Absolutely not. Yes. Hello, everybody. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you very much, Ivana, and uh, let's start with uh, the EC General Data Protection Regulation and uh, the focus of, of this presentation, which is how does the research community benefit or does it benefit from new EC General Protection Regulation? Uh, of course. There is some technical problems here. Should always be when we do this kind of things. Here we are. Good. Well, as you all know, Europe recently got a new data protection reform approved by Parliament in April this year. And uh, it's been a long process before the Parliament vote in uh, in April. Actually, the work started in 2010 by the Commission asking the Parliament uh, to have the possibility to do some overhauling of the complete EC data protection rules. And uh, in uh, 2012, the, par the Commission actually proposed its first draft, so the Parliament's vote ends more than four years of work. So, what's this all about? We do, of course, have a current Data Protection Directive, which is dating back to 1995, when the world was slightly a little bit different place than today, especially when we talk about the information revolution, in IT, internet, etc., etc. So, one of the main reasons for looking at the new, at the new regulation in the first place is, of course, that the world has changed. Uh, everyone is communicating in completely new ways with smartphones, social media, internet, banking, global transfer, etc., etc. So. Clearly, everyone agreed that we need to update and have a completely new legislation which is fit for the new digital area. And of course, there's no need to say that the explosion in new communication technologies as well as, well as the data explosion, all data that are produced by the sheer communication all of us as citizens do every day, has sort of increased the demand for more protection and uh, stricter protection across Europe and the world for that sake. And uh, from a research point of view, this is of course something we can relate to, we can understand it, but at the same time we will of course be interested that when a new piece of legislation is made, whether it's on national level or on European level, we don't want research interest to get thrown in the pressure or interest to protect privacy. We want to make sure that we have a right balance in every new piece of legislation that is produced and implemented on a national as well as European level. So, 
when the current when the current legislation is produced one of the aim of course is then to give back to citizens the control of their personal data but at the same time and that's important for us as researchers clearly the aim was also to create a high uniform uniform level of data protection across ECU, e, e, EC and that's actually good news for research because one of the big problems with the existing data protection regulation in Europe is not only that it's old fashioned in a way that it's not fit for the digital age but it's implemented in national legislation and not least in practice in a very different way across Europe which means that if you want to start a research project for instance if you're a Norwegian researcher and you have a research project together with your colleagues in the UK in, in no way there will be much more strict regulation on for instance the requirement with regard to consent than in the UK and likewise there will be different different practice with regard to providing access and allowing use of data that are already collected for a different purpose than the one we want to use these data for in our research project. So by and large the aim to put an end to the patchwork of data protection rule that currently exists in EC like the European Commission in their press release in December 2015 sort of put high on the level on the on the purpose of the total new overhaul of the EC regulation is very welcome from a research point of view because if if this purpose is achieved it may actually remove barriers and un unlock opportunities like the Commission and the EC system claims to be one of the primary aim of the new legislation it's to remove unjustified barriers with regard to limit cross-border data flow so when the new regulation is marketed as an instrument to ensure a high level of privacy protection across Europe. That's also a, me, a measure or a mechanism to remove barriers and to ensure that data can flow across borders, not only for commercial purposes, which we all know is on the top agenda in the EC, but also for research purposes. So, so far this sounds quite promising for research when we just look into what's the intention of the new legislation. So why does this concern us at all? Why don't we leave all this legal legal stuff to with with a lawyer, with a law profession? Clearly we know that in order to, to do our job as researchers or as research infrastructures sharing disseminating data for research purposes be it uh, the, the research data archives the SESTA data archives as Iwana mentioned in her introduction or administra administrative units in state governments statistical offices and so forth researchers to share your own data in line with the requirement in Horizon 2020, for example. First of all, we need access to data. And of course, in order to tackle all the big challenges in the world, we need access to relevant data, not only any kind of data. So one of the issues today is not that we don't have data. We have a data explosion. There's a lot of lot of data produced across Europe and across the world every day that has a 
huge potential for providing insights into health issues, environmental issues, economy, political behavior, migration patterns, etc. The big challenges Europe and the world is facing today. But in order to do our job as researchers, we need access to high quality data. And of course, there are a lot of issues that has to be dealt with in order to provide access to high quality data for research. But clearly, an adequate legal framework, an ethical framework, which safeguard legitimate research interests regarding the need for use of personal data and also for data producers and data holders to share the data has to be in place. Lack of an adequate legal framework goes hand in hand with low access to, for instance, data that are already existing in statistical system. High level of uh, strict privacy regulation like in the Nordic countries which have always had the strictest privacy regime in the world also go hand in hand with high access, high level of access to administrative and statistical data. So it's not like there's a conflict between access and privacy. It's more that we need to have the right balance, that we need to have the right framework. And this applies whether we as researchers collect our data directly from the data subject, interviewing, observation, tests, etc., etc., blood, blood samples in the health sciences, or whether we collect our data from various sources and data holders that already have collected that data from different purposes. So it's important for all of us to understand that legal law and legal practice are important for us. And we're not we have to be aware of that during the whole process from when they start drafting the legislation not engage only when it's finished. And if you look back at the process of drafting this new uh, legislation in the EC, I can say for sure that if it wasn't for the research community in Europe, in particular within the medical and health sciences, but also the social sciences, and they're advocating for the research interest to be incorporated into the new regulation. The situation as of today would have been looked much worse for the working condition, future working condition for research with regard to consent requirements, uh, the possibilities to do research without explicit consent, which is instrumental for having the possibility for statistical offices, administrative uh, data producers to share their data. So there's a lot of issues in the law that has really consequences for the way we work from collecting, analyzing, preserving and possibilities and abilities to share data. And at the end of the day, it's, it's about ensuring that we have a framework that keeps the balance between different societal values. Data protection is one, access to information in order to improve society is another one, and to keep the trust relationship, to build and keep the trust relationship and between the different actors the one who, the data subject, the researchers, the funders, the data protection authorities, etc., etc. So, now we have a new EC legislation and, and of course the big question questions are how will the new legislation affect our possibility to collect, process, use, share various types of data? Will the condition be tightened like we thought when the 
proposal for a new legislation was moving from the Commission through the Parliament, through the Council, and then eventually ended up as a, a final proposal and uh, agreed on by all parties. Will the various fields of science exploring research topics and questions that can only be answered by analyzing data on, a video, on an individual level and often very sensitive data achieve good, predictable, predictable is important. It's important that when you start a research project today and you are going to continue on tomorrow, you will have the same, you will know that the, that the conditions for what the requirements for consent, for cooperation across countries will be the same whether you move between countries or within different offices in, in your own country and harmonize working, working conditions across Europe. Will the regulation ensure greater harmonization and thus increase opportunities or not? I mean, legal practice, not legal law on paper, is important in this regard. And at the end of the day, the question is, of course, is will society get the knowledge needed to tackle the big challenges in the world? And we know what we got at the moment. We know that we have the Data Protection Directive, which is a legal instrument that by and large works well for sciences. Everything can be improved, but by and large, it works well for sciences. And why do it work well for sciences? Because research and scientific research and research for historical purposes have a special position within the current legislation. And this is not trivial, this is really important, that the provision stating that further processing of personal data for historical, statistical, or scientific purposes is not incompatible with the original purpose. This is the, this is the one fundamental research guarantee, in particular for register-based research, which makes sure that it's possible to open up our data, whether we are data, big data producers or small research process, projects, and share the data with, for research purposes without having to go out and get a new informed explicit consent. Research is seen as compatible. Research for purposes is always seen as compatible, given you have all the safeguards provided for in other parts of the directive. So, today the conditions, even though they vary across Europe, if you look at the data current data protection directive, is research friendly. So, when the Commission proposed a comprehensive reform or the data protection rules in January, of course, all the research stakeholders in Europe looked at once to see what about all the research exemptions and research guarantees incorporated in the existing data protection framework in Europe. Are they included or did they disappear? And the reason why they look at this, of course, is that from 1990 to 1995, a lot of research institutions in Europe worked hard, very hard, to convince the Commission and the Parliament and the, uh, and the Council to include these specific rights within the Data Protection Directive. It was not there in the first place. It had to be fought for. So everyone was sitting ready to look, at least everyone interested in this area, and was looking into the proposal and was able to see that this is not too bad. This looks promising for research, even though the rights of the data subjects was strengthened and consent as the most important mechanism to safeguard privacy was strengthened in the original proposal from, from uh, the Commission. 
and there was a new focus on some sort of bureaucracy, the data protection official, because that institution was made uh, mandatory. By and large, the conclusion was that the Commission's proposal represented more continuity than change in conditions and that it protected basic research interest. However, there was one exemption which worried at least some of us who's been working with this area for research for many, many years. And that was that this important research guarantee that research is always a compatible purpose was moved from the law text to the preamble or the recital, which for most researchers maybe sounds trivial, but but uh, nevertheless, it's what's in the text in the specific law text is what's Sing, provide signals to data protection authorities, data holders and the population at large, whether or not research is seen to be a legit, legitimate interest and uh, have a legitimate rights in order to access uh, <coughs> data. So, to make a long story short, even though everyone was more or less happy with the Commission proposal, moving through the Parliament, the balance clearly shifted in favour of privacy. And the reason I point to this and put your attention to this is that it's important to know that this is not the, the work, working condition for research is very much rely on the legal and ethical framework and nothing has to be taken for granted and even though we have a quite research friendly proposal from the Commission, moving through the Parliament the opposite happened. Uh, the first report, the so-called Albrecht, Albrecht report, practically dropped all important research provisions, stating that scientific research is not special with, with regard to its public interest, which of course surprised everyone, and uh, stating explicitly that scientific research do not deserve a privileged position within the legal framework. And for instance, for instance with regard to the consent requirements, it stated that processing of sensitive data for historical, statistical and scientific research purposes is not as urgent or compelling as public health or social protection. Con consequently, there's no need to introduce an exception which would put them on the same level as the other listed justification. This, of course, was devastating and caused widespread worries and concern among all stakeholders across Europe and uh, the excitement was quite great when the Parliament vote came in March 2014 and a relief because the Parliament modified Albrecht's proposal but still it was represented stricter conditions for research especially with regard to consent requirement. This was in March 2014 and it took even one more year before the Council's general approach appeared and which represented a, a relief to the research community because it restored the balance and again all the research rights under Article 6.2 on laws, uh, all the research rights was back. So, the four year moving through the system illustrate that 
the research interests and the way the research as, a, as an important societal value is incorporated in the general data protection legislation is extremely important. And the balance between different interests like privacy and research could be shifted in one way or another and by that endanger or really hamper research, empirical research on a national as well as European and international level. And again then contradicting other policy areas like open science, uh, open data, etc, etc. So luckily when a new data protection regulation was implemented, I'm happy to say that it's research friendly. And uh, some of my colleagues in, in uh, the data protection areas across Europe think it's too research friend friendly. But from a research point of view, the balance is clearly restored. Even though the data subject rights are strengthened, which is good, through more control requirements, requirements with regard to information, rights to uh, ask for erasure, to object, to be forgotten, to access their own information. These rights are not absolute. The consent requirements are not absolute, which was not the case in earlier drafts of the regulation. Consent is still a key mechanism for, for protecting privacy, however, there are numerous and legitimate exemptions for scientific and historical research, like in Article 5, where it's explicitly stated that further processing of personal data for archiving purposes in the public interest or scientific, statistical, historical purposes shall not be considered incompatible with the initial purpose. And this is extremely important for all research based on big data, however we define it, social media data, Facebook, administrative data, statistical data, etc, etc, etc. This is the article that make, that ensure that research and scientific work on already existing personal identifiable information is possible given that all the safeguards listed in Article 83 are in place. It's possible without collecting a new consent. Also, with regard to sharing our data, opening our data, in line with requirements from Horizon 2020, from national research councils, etc., etc. In Article 5, it's clearly stated that personal data may be stored for longer periods, even when it's not needed to fulfill the original purpose for which, for which the data was collected, is possible for historical, statistical, and scientific purposes. This is extremely important for data infrastructure, infrastructures like SESTA, it's important for SESTA archives, it's important for, for the national archives, it's important for statistical agencies, it's important for research projects who wants to share the data, to store the data in a research infrastructure, etc. Also, with regard to the processing of special categories of data, which by and large is sensitive data, the requirement is strict. The requirement is explicit consent, freely given, informed, 
specific and unambiguous. However, this requirement is also not absolute. For instance, if the processing relates to personal data, which are mani manifestly made public by the data subject, this requirement do not comply, which has something to say for using, for instance, Facebook data, data that are made public by the data subject. So this is something that could have big consequences for using data harvested from internet, from different platforms from internet. However, it, 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 it doesn't apply that using these data without collecting consent is ethically, uh, is ethical and that is the, even though it's legal, it could be legal to use these data without collecting a consent, but ethical framework has also to be considered, but that's not the main topic for my presentation here. However, it also states that that uh, processing of special categories of data is necessary for arch archiving purposes in the, in the public interest or scientific and historical purposes is possible without explicit consent. So there are three, these are three, three uh, bases for processing of special categories of data, sensitive data, which is prohibited unless you have explicit consent, you have a scientific purpose or data is made public by you and me on, for instance, internet through our communication. However, there is a possibility for member states to introduce further conditions with regard to specific health data, which has to be looked into from a research point of view in the future. There's been a lot of talk about the right to be forgotten, but also this right is not absolute and does not apply for archiving purposes in the public interest or for scientific and statistical purposes, again. And one of the main worries from the point of view of medical and health research was the proposal in Article 81, in the former proposal, restricting the use of health data without the consent. And this is now completely dropped but combined with the right for member states to, to introduce further condition, which is good use for medical and health research, not least epidemiological research, using all these national health registers and yeah. So having focused on all the research rights and exemption for research, it's not like it's just go ahead, do your research, no consent, like this. We have a new Article 83, which in combination with all the research exemptions, give the framework for when it will be all right. What's, on what condition could we get access to data from statistical offices, from administrative system, or use inter <coughs> Facebook data without collecting a consent or renewing the consent uh, or the data subject. And there's a lot of safeguards required in order to, to make it uh, okay to process data without basing it on the consent of the data subject. To protect right and freedom, so the data subject, there's technical measures, organizational measures, and also the principle of data minimization, which of course means to process data you need in order to fulfill your purpose. To 
the identifier data to use a pseudonym if possible. In earlier proposal that was a requirement, but now it's if possible in order to fulfill your purpose. So by and large the framework conditions is good from a research point of view. But of course providing research and the society with these favorable rights with regard to processing often very sensitive information that are hold in different data institution. You also need to have some sort of regulatory mechanism in order to have some check and balances in the system. The overall regulatory mechanism from the old system is, is abolished. There will be no more, more or less no more requirement to notify data protection authorities in your own country or to uh, collect the prior license from the data protection authority on, in your own country. The main responsibility is put on the research institution. Used to be also, but it's the research institution, the data controller, that are responsible to make sure that we as researchers comply with all the requirements within the law. And uh, the main instrument in the new legislation is that the data protection officer as an instrument for the institution will be mandatory in all institutions with more than 250 employees, which basically means that all universities uh, research institute, larger research institution will have to have a designated data protection officer within their organization as an in instrument for conducting the required assessment of high risk processing, not of all high risk processing, but also documenting the processing of personal data within your research institution. So when we talk about that the main mechanism for protection privacy, protecting privacy within, within uh, this regulation is the consent, consent for that I as a citizen should have the right to access my information and to provide consent for processing, which is not absolute because of all the, the exemptions for research for instance. The second uh, instrument to protect privacy is that the responsibility on the institution is increased uh, dramatically actually and that every, as a measure to to, to, uh, uh, to do their work this data protection official is made mandatory so this may, in some countries, this may introduce a little bit more bureaucracy, but it's, it's also uh, has to be seen as a way to, to make sure that we have this fra fra framework building a trust relationship between different st stakeholders like data subjects and, 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 uh, and researchers and research funders. So, to conclude, the signal so far is that research is, <clears throat> is always compatible, which actually improves condition for and increases possibility for register-based research. And uh, all of you doing this kind of research should look into recital 125. It's no time to go into it, but it states very explicitly why do we have this kind of provisions within the legal framework. It's because research is important. We need 
high quality empirical research within various scientific fields to provide all this knowledge we need to solve all our big problems. And this is incorporated into the recitals and the preamble of the law. And this is really important for, for research because it signals to all data registers for data protection authorities, uh, privacy advocates, as well as the society at large that this is this is not any kind of uh, processing or personal information. This is something we need. This is seen as something useful and we need to be open about it, that research actually is conducted on information that is gathered already in all these registers and, and, and the new digital media. So the legal basing, basis for using new types of data in all four fields of research is there. But at the same time, there is this note in Article 9.5 that member states may maintain or introduce further condition with regard to the processing of genetic data, biometric data, health data, including limitations with regard to the processing of special categories of data health data. And what does this mean? How will that be translated into national legislation and practice and European uh, legislation? Will the <clears throat> general data protection regulations succeed given the scope for member states to introduce further conditions and limitations? Uh, if we look to Norway there's already been a discussion and the Norwegian Data Protection Authority states that they will advocate the individual right to privacy and push for, at least in Norway, and maybe even also other member states, to introduce more limitations on scientific use of special categories of data. If they are successful, will this contradict efforts to achieve similar condition for research across Europe? I ask because this is in the making which means that even though we have a research friendly regulation representing more continuity than change, we're not yet there. The regulation is now in the making and will be in fact in, will be implemented across Europe in 2018. So what's happening at this point of time is that uh, the European Data Protection Authority, the new one, will work together with the national data protection authorities and help them to implement the law on a national level. But there still is some scope for, for the national level and, and we still have to see and we still have to be aware and we still have to be try to, to influence what's going to happen during the next two years with regard to, to uh, uh, protect the research interest or at least the legitimate research interest because we also have to remember and we also have to understand that an adequate legal framework which safeguard privacy and provide a high level of privacy is fundamental in order to ensure access to personal data for scientific purposes. And, and this is really important to understand that a high level of data protection has been a success, for instance, in the Nordic country with, with regard to providing access to data because you have the framework to work within. And it's also, of course, in important in order to, to make sure that we can we can share share our data in a in an ethical and legal way. So participants in research need protection, but actually research itself 
and researchers need protection, especially in this world of open science, open access, and this new digital world. It's really important that research is seen as something special, something different from all these other uses of all this information, and that research need protection. And research has been granted a very high level of protection within the current data protection directive as well as in, in the new general data protection regulation and we should be very very thankful for that. So it's not that we don't want protection but we have to see that the right balance is achieved and in order to do that we have to be active and not sit on defense when all the others draft the national legislations and how to implement this uh, legislation. Of course, society need, need access, but we have to find the right balance. So in order to have some minutes for questions, I think I have to end here. And hand over the word to Martin. someone else. Yeah, to Martin. To Martin Hello, Victor. <laughs> this is Martin. Thank you very much for that comprehensive and really great uh, introduction and, and presentation on the regulation, on the data protection regulation. So, my name is Martin Kaltenberg. I'm from the Semantic Web Company. Ivan already introduced me, thanks a lot, uh, and being a partner in the Big Data Europe project. Um, I guess as a, as a short summary, uh, I see that you are, uh, you see the data protection as a, a very good piece of work, the adaptation, that is uh, what I have learned and understood, mainly for research and science. And uh, just to, uh, to remind or let our audience know, so you see still the chat window in your panel, you can drop in there the questions, we are collecting them and we already have collected some of them or lots of them. So let's see and start the Q&A session now. And at the end of the webinar, you see some announcements here. I will just tell you uh, what comes next in Big Data Europe. But let's go to the questions. So I have here uh, one concrete question that is on data protection officer institution. Um, the question is from now on, it is mandatory, but uh, do some EU countries already have it in place? Yes, uh, some countries do have it in place, for instance in Norway and Sweden and uh, I guess some other countries as well, but, but in, in Norway we had this uh, uh, arrangement from 2000 and yeah, from, from uh, we got a new Norwegian legislation in 2001 or Two and mm -hmm. Sweden also. So yes, there are some experience. All right, this. that's interesting. Thank you very much. And there's a, a, a second one that is a little bit uh, similar. It's about the data protection officer that you mentioned that is obligatory for organizations with more than 250 employees. Um, the question is, is there something like a repository or in other words, is it transparent across Europe that organizations are really making use of that or really uh, yeah, somehow nominating data protection officers? Did you hear about that? Yes. Now, as one of the reasons why it's mandatory in this new legislation is uh, uh, because this is not a new institution. It's also incorporated in the data directive. And because so few countries has taken the opportunity to, to appoint a data protection officer. And uh, at the same time, now the European... Uh, the, the idea is to simplify the procedures to remove all this obligation to notify national data protection authorities. They mm -hmm. make it mandatory. So it, it's been there. The responsibility is more or less the same that's been in the data directive, but no, it's mandatory. Okay. And that's the biggest change. So there's no, at this point of view, there's no European register for data protection officers. All right. 
Uh -huh. I just I'm I'm aware of this new transparency register, so maybe uh, it would be a good idea. But I'm just thinking out loud to expand that for data protection offices. However, um, there's another one in place here. This is uh, yeah has NDS or a system member drafted language for consent forms that enables data archiving and comply with the GDPR. Yes, uh, very relevant and very often asked questions. Uh, if, you, if you go to the various uh, national SESTA data archives, uh, at least in some of them, you may find guidelines on how to draft your information and consent forms. But since research is not standard, it's impossible to, to have a standardized information and research form. But you can have guidelines in order to, to help and examples, best practices All in right. different research fields in order to, to, uh, to help drafting these uh, yeah, consent forms. And that are developed within the SESTA area in, in some of the SESTA projects we are working on, on various, various best practices with regard to overcome barriers regarding access to, to data and using data without consent and, and even with consent. Okay, I got you right. These these guidelines or, or templates, I can go to the SESTA website and then I go to yeah. the national partner sites, or or if you go to to okay. NSD, you will find uh, some some guidelines, but mostly in Norwegian, which is no help. <laughs> For Norwegians, it is, but, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, oh, hard, there yeah. will be uh, as part of some of the SESTA projects and, and series project there will be developed best practices All right. and uh -huh. guidelines in English. Oh, okay, that's great. Uh -huh. So maybe that's just a pointer to Ivana when, we, when you have something in place and we can uh, also send it out and publish it on the Big Data Europe website or mailing list. So if you take care about that then we will let you know if there is something in place from the SESTA project. Um, another one, another question I has here, have here with this is uh, also a good one. What is historically in the sense of GDPR? Is there a time limit in place? Uh, the time limit limit is two years from now. 2018, it will be mm -hmm. in effect in all European Union countries and associated countries. That's the time okay. limit. Two years. Two years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, just to repeat that, I'm, I'm not fully sure, maybe we have a, a misunderstanding here, because I think the question is the historical, uh, because you mentioned historical data or data that is ah. that you can archive. I'm not sure, maybe I got a misconception here. Yeah. But, uh, that's also well, an interesting question, so <laughs> how long may I use that archived, or is, is there a limit uh, of personal no. data? Or? No. Okay. No. All right. That depends. But there's no limit. It, uh, of course, national archives store data for eternity. All right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, there's another one that is um, a short one and simple one, maybe also to Ivana. Is there a Romanian member in SESTA? Oh, not, not yet. We are hoping to, to get uh, Romania as the new member quite soon, but they are still in um, accession process, let's call it like that, and uh, mm -hmm. with some changes um, that happened recently, with change of government, we are actually hoping to, to proceed more quickly from now on with them, but no, uh, their national archive, actually the social science data archive, RODA, is uh, the, let's call it associated archive of, of SESDA uh, consortium, and there are actually participating in, in many activities, but they're not the official member yet, and we are hoping that they will become soon. Okay, thank you very much. Um, by the way, the clarification, I think, regarding the historical 
data question is because uh, in your talk you mentioned historical purposes. So we get yes. an add on to that question. So, um, but I think we already clarified. Um, another one is very nice here saying, Hi Victis, can you explain more about what it meant, what is meant by special categories of data that you mentioned? Special categories of data is a new term introduced uh, in uh, this new legislation and it's usually we, we think about it as various types of sensitive data but it's it's uh, it's uh, specified in Article 9 as racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, mm -hmm. religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, health data, etc., etc. Data okay. concerning health, sex life, sexual mm -hmm. orientation, etc. So it's uh, yeah, it's that kind of. So these are the types which of is, sorry, which, I, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and and the point is that the requirements with regard to the processes processing of personal data, the consent requirements is less strict with regard to the processing of other types of personal data, and uh, the requirement with regard to to uh, special categories of data are stricter, but they are also lifted for research. So, you have exemptions for research even on the strict requirements for processing of special categories of data, sensitive data. All right. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. I think that gives a very good clarification of that. We have uh, a little bit over time, but I think let's take two or three questions because there are so many of them. So the interest is very high. There is one that says, does the regulation say anything new or different about transferring data outside uh, the EEA? The, the main it's, it's actually there is a requirement that is, is if the data controller or the, da the, the data controller, the, the institution responsible for processing the data is located outside the EU, the general data protection regulation applies. So it's possible to to, uh, to as, as earlier it's possible to transfer data across borders also outside uh, the EU, but only if the level of protection is at the same level as inside the EU. I don't have the specific uh, provision in front of me, but it's possible, it's still possible, but it's still highly regulated which is, has been in the past as well, with regard to equivalent level of protection. Yep, I think that's clear. Thank you very much. So I take two more. The one is saying, yeah, the digital world is turning. Is this regulation planned to be reviewed or evaluated and refined uh, in, in some day? Is that already on the plan? Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't, Actually, I don't know, but, but looking at the, the process uh, it takes, it will definitely uh, not be in the near future. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, would, that would be my personal answer to that. However, mm. in this digital world we live, the ethical framework will be maybe even more important in the future, in particular since we, as we speak, we, we uh, in Norway and abroad, we have research projects that are legally sound, but may be ethically in the grey zone. And, and what we experience is that, is that some projects that are, have been clarified from a legal point of view is actually stopped by research ethics committee. So I think when we talk about using all these enormous rich, potentially rich data sources 
that actually is quite new to us uh, in the swear of all internet platforms and I mean you know, all this communication and com uh, communication uh, uh, and transactions data etc etc that we produce 24 hours a day I think the legal basis is is uh, to use them is there but that the challenges uh, and the questions with regard to how to use them and if it's okay to use them will be more from the research ethical side in the future so I think we will see much more development and much more focus on that side also as a combination to the legal framework. Okay, thanks a lot for that. By the way, we have a comment by uh, Arya from Finland, I guess, saying that the FSD in Finland has guidelines for informing research participants in English too. And I think the link is on the question uh, panel, but we will share it also. There will be a blog post on the Big Data Europe uh, website afterwards where we put together all the information and the recording will be linked and so on and so forth. Um, as I see that participants are leaving our webinar, Victus, yeah. I would say, uh, and we're over time, let's stop here. So thank you very, very much. We have more questions uh, and I will provide them to you. Um, let me, on the one hand side, thank you. So that was really uh, great insights. And um, on the other hand side, just before saying goodbye to everybody, taking a look at the slides, uh, something final from our side where you can have more information and access more insights into the Big Data Europe project that is a coordination and support action going until the end of 2017. So on the one hand side, we are planning to have a workshop uh, on social science, uh, the second one, but the first one this year on the 5th of December. Uh, it will be in Cologne, uh, back to back to the Eddy conference. Um, in Germany, so we will inform also on the website if you're interested to participate that's open for discussions regarding data protection but also big data technologies and all the other issues coming up with dealing with data management and very close already there is the European Data Forum in Eindhoven in the Netherlands uh, 29th and 30th of June uh, that's free of charge, so it's a free community event, so if you're around there, or if you're interested to uh, discuss data topics uh, across Europe and, and meet other people from research, from industry, and so on, then just join in and we will have a booth there with Big Data Europe, so you also meet us there, and then you see a lot of things like website and community groups and so on, so if you're interested, just uh, please share and maybe Ivana you can just show us the next slide it's uh, the short and last slide and we will publish that it's more or less the contact information uh, of all of us so starting with uh, the tester team and Victis email addresses and also mine so if you're interested to get in touch uh, and have more information about Big Data Europe just feel free and also about the data protection directive and uh, on SESTA and so on and so forth. Just get in touch with us. We are publishing the slides, the recording, um, and also question answering and a little bit of more information that came in during the last hour on the website. Uh, and we will do that, I think, latest in one week from today, so early next week. Uh, that's all from my side. So thanks a lot, Victis. Thanks a lot, Ivana. Thanks, Thomas, for supporting us from the technical side. And I give back to say goodbye to Ivana. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, the only thing left to say is actually goodbye from the side and uh, again, one huge uh, thank you to, to, to Big Dis and to great presentation and I hope that everybody actually enjoyed it. So thanks again to all participants and thanks to all panelists and thanks to Big Dis and it was really nice uh, having so many so many participants on this, this webinar. So we have two more to go this year and uh, let's hope that all our webinars will be uh, attended like this one. So thank you, thank you and, and goodbye from our side. <laughs>